my the rest of my family didn't appreciate this opening uh, slide with the the cow patty right in the middle of it. But once again, this is what we're looking at. Uh, this is what we want on the land. This is how we want to build soil health. So, you know, the the I use five soil health principles. You know, if you listen to some people, they're at three, some are four, some are you know I've even seen fifteen different soil health principles. And, and I like five because I got this many fingers. So this way it's easy for me to remember. So, so number one, the, the number one thing I say in soil health, if you can have a living root in, in, of a plant in the vegetative stage throughout that whole growing season, if you only do one thing, that is where I recommend people starting. Now that's the simple thing. Uh, number two is reducing your tillage. And in with with USDA, they have another line of maintaining armor. And if you're reducing armor or reducing tillage, I I I think that you're going to maintain better soil armor on on that soil anyway. So uh, number three, uh, which a lot of people don't talk about, is reducing uh, the use of synthetics. Uh, that's one of them that when you listen to uh, Joel Williams, you listen to uh, Christine Jones, you listen to, you know, all of the, 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 all of my mentors and everybody says, we have to make sure we're making our soil biology work for us. And as soon as we start using a lot of synthetics, we are outsourcing those, those jobs of those soil microbes. So we have to keep those, those soil microbes working. We want to increase our plant diversity. And number five, we want to incorporate livestock onto our land. Those are the five that I use when I'm talking to people when, when we're talking about uh, soil health. So this livestock integration part, you know, it's not necessary in today's management to, uh, to, to build the soils, to have that livestock on the land, but it does, the, does cause that, that healing and building process uh, to happen so much faster. Our soils have been built over thousands of years of having grazers going over top of them. So if we can, you know, incorporate a lot of these natural principles into our operation, it's going to just make it go better. Now, how did they, how did those grazers manage the grass? Well, instead of having, you know, the old uh, vantage of building a, an inch of soil over, you know, a hundred years, that we can do it faster. And this is through through more intensive management. So we want to look at how our soils were built. It was built with grass. It was built with grazers. And you know how do we build on that to make this system work? Now the problem we have in modern agriculture is the situation of this soil sample on the right. This is a sample that uh, one of my customers, they grew cover crops for three years. And after the third year, they said they had nothing growing on their land. And I said, well, what do you mean? So he said, nothing, nothing grew. So I jumped in the truck, drove four hours, went, got my shovel, went to go stick it in the ground, jumped on the shovel and I'm 230 pounds. So when I jump on a shovel, it usually goes in the ground. There it didn't. But when I finally found a spot where I could get it in the ground and started bringing up, you can see that's you know, lack of soil structure. Um, you know, the, all the plating, this is on sandy soil too. So you can see all the lines running horizontal. And so what was happen, happening in this case was overgrazing, uh, under resting, uh, grazing when it was wet, all of the things we don't want to do the soil. So in modern agriculture, you know, we can do the same thing by over tilling, um, over grazing, not having that plant diversity. And once again, we're talking about functional plant groups. We're talking about uh, the different root types. Uh, reduction of soil, active soil microbes, especially the fungi. And the loss of soil carbon and organic matter in our soils. So those are the issues that we're seeing in modern agriculture. Well, and then uh, over, over reliance on, on synthetic inputs. So when we start looking at cover cropping, Cover cropping is going to allow us to have more animal impact. And how we can do that is using, you know, tools like relay cover cropping. So a relay cover crop is when you have your main crop that you're growing, 
You're going to have this relay cover crop seeded either at the same time or delayed seeding, depending on, on what your goals are. And when you harvest your main crop, this relay cover crop is going to continue growing until freeze up for the next year or whatever, once again, what your goals are. So that this way you can maintain that, that, that plant and vegetative stage throughout that whole growing season. We can do intercropping. So this is growing two crops at the same time and then harvesting them. And if you're in, in cash crop situation, we can do the separation of, of the, the seed or in the case of producing feed, having some oats and, and peas growing together so that this way we have a, a, a better feed, less inputs, all the things that we're looking for in, in that standpoint. We can do a full season cover crop. So the full season cover crop is, you know, depending on what the goals are, uh, whether we're going to be haying it, we're going to graze it, we're going to salage it, or we're just going to let it use as a green manure. But the plan is instead of having summer follow or chem follow, we can have this full season cover crop. And so we can be aiming at specific uh, issues in the soil or requirements on the farm that we need to meet those goals. The capture crop or post-harvest cover crop. This is when, if we were going to be uh, growing a field of uh, oats or barley, and we're gonna be haying that off, now we have nothing growing in a field. We turn around and we slap in a cover crop in the fall to get growing to, once again, have something green and growing. This past uh, fall, when we, we moved into olds in, in the end of September, and the first part of September, there was a big hailstorm apparently uh, in the area and, and the crop was still standing. The hailstorm knocked out a lot of the grain, fell on the ground. And as I was moving in, I thought, man, this is awesome. Everybody's into cover cropping and, and look how nice everything is green. Then next week when I drove through that area again, everything turned orange. They sprayed it, which just absolutely blows my mind when you have an, a, a spring seeded crop that gets hailed in September and is green and growing in the fall, there's this guy that I know called Jack Frost that would take care of it for free. In the meantime, up to freeze up, it's still gonna be capturing sunlight, it's gonna be photosynthesizing, and, and in the, when the plant's in that vegetative stage, it'll release up to 80% of the carbon it captures through photosynthesis into the soil to feed the soil biology. And this is how we build soil, is, is photosynthesis and root exudates. So, uh, it uh, made me sad when I saw people spraying it and then turn around and they're, they're feeding bales. Uh, it just blew my mind. Uh, the other option is when we're dealing with these cover crops are short-term or long-term perennial forages. Uh, it's a cover crop. It's a living plant. It's, uh, it's once again, checking off a lot of the boxes in that soil health uh, principles. So on our farm, when, when I started to, I wanted to get more animal impact on my farm. I wanted to get, uh, you know, more diversity growing on my, on my, on my, uh, in my soils. What I started doing is looking around for someone to partner with. I do not want to own the animals. I do not have time to manage animals day to day. I don't have the knowledge to manage these animals day to day. I'm an agronomist. I know how to grow plants. So, and I spent, you know, half my winters usually out in Alberta doing presentations like this. And I didn't have time to, you know, really babysit these animals. So I was looking for a partner to work with so that they would manage the animals. I would manage the feed and, and how they're being fed during the winter. But I needed someone that had ownership of the animal besides me. So then I found uh, I was working with one of our neighbors for 15 years. Then he sold his his farm. So okay, that didn't that didn't go as long as I wanted. But uh, but you know there was everybody. Well, I found enough people that were wanting to work with me to uh, to to you know extend their feed, reduce their workload, expand their herd, all of those things that you know people, most people want to do. So that this way, it uh, the, the last two years we were custom grazing bison. So that meant a little more infrastructure on, on the perimeter fence. So it was a, a five strand high tensile fence is what we put up. 
And um, I grew the feed, he brought the animals over, we grazed them through, and in the spring picked them up, it worked out really well. So that, that custom grazing part of it, it works really good for, you know, grain producers that, you know, don't have experience with the animals. And, and once again, I would looked at it from the standpoint of, do I need to repeat the mistakes that, you know, these ranchers, they already know these, what to do. So why not work with their expertise? They can work with, with my knowledge and my land base and we can do a win-win. So the custom grazing worked really well for me. So then the compensation, when we're going to go through and say, okay, so what is it worth? Well, it's going to go back to the compensation is going to be determined on how much each party does. So that if I'm just, uh, you know, I, I supply the land and the livestock producer puts up the fence and he has the water and he move, manages the moves and does all of the day-to-day -day stuff. You're, the, the landowner is not going to make as much as if, okay, I put up the fence, I have the watering system. I'm going to be managing the, the, the feed management through the growing season. And, uh, and so I got compensated more. So that's one of the things we need to, to know on both sides. We have to make it a win-win. And so what I would do is, okay, I told the, the bison producer that, okay, this is, this is what I will do. I'll check them. I'll, you know, if someone's limping or something happened out there, you know, I'll phone them and tell them I'll maybe take a video, show them what, how, how that animal's limping or, or what they look like. And, uh, and besides that, it's, it's all up to them. So it, it like I said, it, it was a good win-win. And so I, I told the livestock producer to tell me how much he would pay me to do that. So when we're looking at setting up these systems and uh, using cover crops, uh, really cover crops, full seasons, what we want to do is look at what our goals are. We want to look at short-term goals. So for this year, what do we want to do in the long term? So is that three years, five years, 10 years? Where do we want to be? How do, our, how do we want our land to look? And so one of the things about using the livestock integration and, and these cover crops, it's a really easy way of converting land from conventional production into organic production because you need that three-year transitional period. And when you have that three-year transitional period of growing these cover crops, you're, you're going to have the livestock integration. You're going to you know, do all of these things that we want to do to build soil health. And at the end of the day, one of the things that I'm, I'm a firm believer in is, is this fungal to bacteria ratio. And what we want to do is build more fungi in our soil. Our soils tend to be uh, bacterial dominated. And so what we want to do is build more and more fungi in the soil. And that's, you know, it, it, it's going to create uh, better soil aggregates, better uh, soil structure, um, more carbon sequestration, the list just goes on and on about uh, how, how much benefit we get out of building fungi in the soil. So when we're sort of looking at, okay, so we have these cover crops or, or, or uh, whether it's a, a forage stand, like this alfalfa field or, or an annual or a biennial, by having these, the, this hay or silage in rotation as, as a, a grain producer, it actually helps clean up the land without adding any tillage. So this way we can do some cultural control of some of these weeds that we have. The negative is, is it will export nutrients off of that field. But the positive is, uh, Jay Fuhr in one of his presentations uh, mentioned that up to 80% of the carbon above ground in the plant is going to be lost through um, microbial respiration, through oxidation, all these other uh, uh, decom decomposition uh, uh, pathways. So, okay, so we're not going to lose any organic matter per se by bailing that off, but those nutrients are, are a bit of a concern of losing them. And we want to make sure that when we are uh, baling or silaging this, this top growth off, we need to maintain some soil armor. So we don't want to shave it right to the ground and then have the plant die. So having something green after you cut 
it's an awesome thing. So, you know, we use a lot of Italian ryegrasses in, in mixes like this. So this way we have something green going up into the fall. So the, the last point again is the soil organic matter is built through root exudates, through micro growth and through roots. This is how we build organic matter. When I went through university, the, the thought process was the way we build organic matter is grow something tall and then work it into the ground. And that's what a lot of the organic uh, mindset has been set at too for, for many years. And so they're doing a lot of these green manures. That's good. You get that, that you know, that, that fiber back into the soil. But what are they doing after? You need that capture crop after you plow that in to maintain that, that green plant growing in the fall to reduce the tillage to, to do all of these things that we, we need to do to build soil. So a bit of a, a compromise between the hay and silage to, to try and maintain some of the, the, the nutrients in the available form is to do a hay and graze. So you take cut a hay off, eat that regrowth after, and now we can go out there and we can do some grazing. So this way you get the animal impact on it. So you get the manure and urine back onto that soil. The other nice option with it is do a modified to bale grazing so that when you're going out and you're going to bale up the, the hay and instead of taking the bales off, just leave the bales there or leave part of the bales there. So if you leave a third, a half, whatever. So that this way you get into areas where and where you do get more snow. And so swath grazing is a bit of a challenge. If you have a bales already sitting out in the field, well, guess what? You're going to need a lot of snow to bury those bales so that the cows can't get to them. And if there's that much snow, you got bigger problems than that. So, so it could be a, another way of, of getting those animals out into those fields. So when we start talking about grazing, now what, when people say they, they want to do some grazing, one of the things I ask is, are you looking at rotational grazing, continuous grazing, stockpile grazing, and that stockpile grazing, are we looking at grazing in the fall, the winter, or the spring? Which are all opportunities, and we just have to adjust what we're doing, what we're, what we're putting into these blends to make it work. One of the things that I have mentioned in a lot of my presentations is one of the biggest things that we are short of in Western Canada for grazing is cross fencing. We need to have this high intensity uh, stocking rates and we need to be able to move these animals because when, when we look at, 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 uh, at, at beef animals, when you turn them out into a quarter section of, of pasture, they spread out. When we look at the bison, uh, the bison are, are nature's mob grazers. And so they're always in a, a tight mob and they're going through. And so they'll, they'll go through and they'll, they'll, they do a better job of grazing per se, um, because when you get these animals congested all together, they're going to be grazing stuff hard. And when they're done grazing it, they're going to leave it alone for a longer period of time. And so that's going to allow that plant to rest more, get more, produ um, more production. That's the whole idea of this, this uh, rotational grazing and, and allowing those plants to, to fully recover before they get bit again. So when we start grazing, uh, you know, there's there's a couple of opportunities. So we can be, you know, managing residues. So after we we uh, go out and combine a, a field of, of oats, uh, we'll throw the animals out there. They're going to graze the straw, and the where you get the most benefit of is if once again we have some Italian ryegrass, we have some Persian clover, we have some some other plants growing underneath that straw or in between the, the, the windrows that the animals can go out, they can eat something green and they're gonna eat the straw. Because when we start looking at, at how the soil functions and how the rumen functions, it's amazing how similar those two ecosystems are. That's weird calling a rumen an ecosystem, but you know when you understand how they work, uh, it, it's really dynamic systems of, of, of how they do uh, act the same. The other option or the other positive of, of having some grazing on, on the residues is you get to clean up some of the unseeded acres. So the sloughs, the fence rows, uh, if you have some bush out there, the 
animals go in there and they'll kind of clean those up for you. The nice thing about this, the, the residue grazing is it, it tends to be low cost. The, the negative is, is it may be un, unevenly grazed if you, if you just turn the cows out. So this is where, you know, having a little bit of cross fencing isn't a, isn't a bad thing. It, it, anytime you increase your management tent, you tend to get better returns out of it. So one of the other options is, you know, to have these cover crops is to, to supply some, some supplemental feed. And so this way, when you have that stubble grazing and, and you're, you're just grazing the, the, the oat straw, for, in, for instance, uh, protein tends to be a little on the low side. So you bring some alfalfa bales in. By bringing that supplemental feed in, that's going to help Im import nutrients and some more carbon into that system. It's going to increase your cost, but it's also increasing the number of days that those, those animals are staying out in that field, which once again, is going to help reduce the, your, your feed cost during the winter or in fall. So your manure, everybody's, uh, you know, you look at this and you say, okay, yep, this is, this is what we, we, the end goal is get manure out in our land. And there's actually a, an app, I think Wisconsin, um, University of Wisconsin has a, a cow pie app. So you take a picture of it and ideally you want to have a relatively round cow pie. It's going to be between one and two inches thick. It's going to be a little shallower in the middle of, of the cow pie. But, and, and you're not going to see a lot of uh, plant material in it. So the one in the picture is, uh, it'd probably be close to a nine out of 10, maybe an eight out of 10. So it's a, a real good cow patty. So when those cow patties hit the ground, they tend to drive your bacterial populations because they're, they're the, the, all of the, the, the food in that cow patty for, for biology is, is already been through. It's already been uh, acted on by the biology in the, the rumen of, of the, the animal and, and hits the ground. So it's going to help drive a lot of uh, bacteria populations in the soil, which is good because the bacteria in the soil, they will cycle nutrients really quickly. Your fungi, they tend to be a little slower for, for releasing nutrients, but uh, to get the bio, the, the, get the higher rates of, of nutrient breakdown and release uh, through the bacteria is going to help produce more grass. So it's, it is a, a, a decent thing. That cow patty is really nutrient dense too. Uh, I've seen some numbers of, of, of how much nutrients are in a, a one cow patty. If you had one cow patty, uh, and you know, cow patties covering a whole quarter section or, or one acre of land, the nutrients are unbelievable in it. So, so it is a good thing and it is all balanced. So your NPKS plus your micros, uh, it's it, the cow and, and the grass and the soil, they all co-evolve co together and the system works. And so for us to go in and, and try and mess it up, uh, we're, we're probably not going to be as effective as, as, if we let the, the whole natural system go with the, um, in the system, uh, by, by throwing that manure in, you're going to be, you know, supporting a lot of the saprophytic microbes. So the, the ones that are going to cause that rotting. So once again, not a bad thing, as long as we have enough residue on the surface. So like I said earlier, the rumen and the soil, very similar in, in how they function. And what we have to do is balance what we're feeding. So if we are, when we're feeding our animals and we're, we're checking the manure and we find that, you know, it's too runny. So they're eating nothing but, uh, you know, uh, metabrome, um, uh, brassicas, things like that, you know, it's going to be really runny. Whereas if you have too much fiber and not enough protein in it, then you start getting these, these hockey pucks. So we need to really balance what we're feeding the animals. And the same thing goes with the soil. So that if we are feeding too much of uh, low, uh, low residue, low lignin type of, of residues to our soils. So this is things like peas, canola, uh, things like that, that, you know, there's not a lot of residue in them. Uh, then we start having some soil issues. So here's two examples of, you know, the cow patty on the left, things are looking pretty good. The one on the right, um, but, we need to get a little better feed quality to them to, to make sure that that rumen is, is as happy as it can be. 
So partnering with someone in the custom grazing, like I said earlier, uh, worked really well for us, um, but you have to make sure you're on the same page. You have to make sure that the responsibilities are set up before you go and you know, you're gonna have to modify them because things change as, as uh, livestock producers may know. But it's something where as long as there's communication, um, you know, things, you know, as, as, a, as a grain producer, to go out and uh, and to go spend time with those bison, it was therapeutic for me. Um, it was a nice change. We had uh, you know more diversity. We we had income coming off the land through October, November, December, January, February, March, whereas most grain farms don't have that income coming off of it. So I was getting income off of the during the summer during the growing season and had income coming off during the winter. So when designing these cover crops, we will need to decide beforehand if we're going to be haying or silaging them, if we're going to be grazing them, are we going to cut and then graze, are we going to swath graze, or are we going to stockpile graze? That's one of the things that we have to decide what we want to do. And on maybe each field, how many acres of each, all the other good stuff. So when we start looking at diversity, of uh, plant diversity, you know, the 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 big five that I talk about when we start talking about functional plant groups are grasses, legumes, broadleafs, and of the broadleafs, there's brassicas, non-brassicas, and forbs. And so I've put together a, a couple of triangles just so it's easy to visualize. And so when, when we look at the grasses, legumes, and then the broadleafs, we're going to be looking at warm and cool seasons of each. We're looking at annuals, biennials, and perennials. This is the different functional plant groups that we can be working with. So when we start looking at grasses, we have lots of choices. Legumes, we have quite a few. Brassicas, okay, so it's fairly limited. Non-brassicas, that's a real diverse group. And then the forbs, for, forbs are one of the, the missing links in soil health and, and animal health. Dr. Christine Jones, she mentioned uh, in a presentation when I was in Brandon, is the average pasture in the world is 60% forb and 40% grass, which kind of blew my mind because where's a legume? And then it was a two and a half hour drive home, so be able to do some thinking on the road home. And when we seed down a, a pasture blend or hay blend, that legume normally only lasts for, you know, if we went with 60% alfalfa and 40% and grass, that, that legume only lasts as, as a dominant part of the blend for only five or six years, and then it kind of peters out. And that's nature's way of, of having, okay, so we're going to get the mycorrhizae cranking with the legumes, we're going to fix some nitrogen to get the grass and the, the other species going, but nature wants the legumes there in a supporting role, but it needs the natural soil-borne end fixers to start taking over plus animal impact. So the animals are going to go in, they're going to graze it, they're going to cycle the nutrients and get things going that way. So when we're looking at grazing, we need plants that are going to regrow after being grazed. That's going to be the best way to get biggest bang for the buck out of this, out of, out of the grazing. So that means we're going to go either with a late maturing uh, species or a biennial plant. We want to keep those in the vegetative stage so they keep on growing. And ideally we use these paddock grazing systems so that this way we graze down an area and then move them on. And so allow that plant to regrow, to recover so it's gonna be get grazed again. And when we're grazing, this is Jay Fuhr, he, he posted this from the, from the Medican Farms down at, at Bismarck. And one of the things he did is he took feed tests of the top half of the plant and the bottom half of the plant of these different species. And really scientific on, on how he, he measure the, where the top half is. So if you had a, a, a plant growing, I can't really see my pen, you just rip it off at the soil surface and balance it on your finger. And where it balances on your finger is 50% weight on both sides. So easy way of, of doing half. So, when you look at the feed tests of say annual ryegrass, top half, bottom half, the top half is better than the bottom half. You go to cowpeas, top half is better than the bottom half. Hairy vetch, top half is better than the bottom half. And you go through and each one of them in these plants, 
the top half is better than the bottom half, except for the the Sudan. I think is the only one. There's a bit of a, a, a weird plant, but that's just a weird plant. So when we are grazing, at, or cutting hay, or silaging, the lower we cut, the more of the bottom part of the plant we're bringing into the feed. The, actually, the worse we're, we're diluting the good stuff of of the feed. So when we're grazing. Jay, his rule of thumb is you graze half and leave half. Uh, if when we're cutting uh, hay, if we can cut higher, we're going to be losing some bales, we're going to lose some tons, but we're gaining on a relative feed value. So that's one of the things to, to be looking at. The other really goofy thing is uh, uh, Clayton Robbins. Uh, from Manitoba. Uh, he's a Nuffield Scholar and he did, it, he did his Nuffield Scholarship based on increasing the room and efficiency. And what he found was if he can have a two to one sugar to protein ratio in the rumen, the rumen performs more efficiently. Two to one sugar to protein. So it isn't the starch um, the more I see of, of, of starch in diets for animals, the more problems I see. When we get into water-soluble carbohydrate, the rumen performs way more efficiently. And that's where a lot of nutritionists and I, uh, we bunt heads on it, but I've seen enough of this stuff where when we're feeding these animals, these high sugar foods, they just, they perform so much better. So going into the, the hay and silage, uh, so, you know, the regrowth isn't as important per se, uh, unless you're going to be grazing after, but you need that hay to dry down. So you can't use a lot of juicy plants. So I, I minimize the amount of brassicas we use in that. Silage can be juicier, so I can bump up the brassicas a bit, but rarely will I go over one plant per square foot when I'm dealing with brassicas in, in a silage mix. It, it just... Uh, Animals don't need that relative feed value. We still need to have that plant that stays in the vegetative stage. So once again, that Italian ryegrass in, in the mix or a winter cereal, all we need is that half to two plants per square foot to make a difference. So it isn't, you know, in, when we're seeding down, um, uh, say oats, once again, uh, we're we'll looking at seeding rates uh, between 25 and, and 35 seeds per square foot. So we're talking for this vegetative plant underneath, we need a half to two. So a really low percentage, but we just need to have that representation there. Your stockpile forage, it needs to hold your, your feed values after it freezes. And the next question is, do we need to have it standing above the snow? You know, uh, if, if we're in a high snowfall area, do we need these plants that stand up or, you know, is it, a, are the animals able to dig through snow to go after it? So that's, that's one of the questions. And then the next one is about wildlife. Uh, you know, are there concerns about, you know, stockpile uh, grazing and the herd of elk move in and then what? And so those are some of the things we want to look at and, and, when you look at some of these species with high sugar content, uh, there was a, a producer from just south of, of Melford. Uh, he was, you know, had his animals out grazing and, and uh, the, the, during deer season, he had, you know, hunter after hunter stopping and saying, can I hunt on your land? And he said, no, I can't, you can't because the animals are out grazing. Finally, after the 10th person, he said, why? Why is everybody asking? He's, the hunter said, out of all of the areas in, like all of the, the places that they were driving around looking for, for animals, the only place they found deer was on his land. And the reason why is because he had high sugar plants like plantain, like Italian ryegrass, chicory, uh, festioleum, high sugar plants. And, these, and the wildlife, they're attracted to high sugar plants. Why? Because nature knows best. And so when you start feeding high sugar or offering high sugar plants to your livestock, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to be attracted to that high sugar. So when we start looking at cash crop uh, rotation, so after when you have livestock on the land, your nutrient cycles tend to speed up. 
between the hoof action, between the manure, between the 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 biology through the gut of the the the, the livestock and you know dropping on the ground, all of that is helping drive your your, your nutrient cycles. Plus, if you can have that green plant going underneath um, that they're grazing, once again, that's just building on that soil health. When you look at a beef cow, uh, the quick rule of thumb is they'll drink about 10 gallons of water per day. And so they're going to lose some in, in respiration, in sweat, and all the other good stuff. But, you know, if you do a quick number of, of you know, is it nine gallons, is it 10 gallons, it doesn't matter. But, you know, 10 gallons of urine per day per, per beef cow, that's, that's a lot of a lot of moisture going back into the ground, never mind all the, the soluble nutrients in that, in that urine. And if you use the quick number that a, a beef cow eats two and a half percent of her body mass per day. So a 1200 pound cow is going to eat about 30 pounds of dry matter per day. Once again, where does all of that fiber go in? It goes out the back. So if you start talking about 30 pounds of manure per cow per day, um, once again, that's, uh, you start putting hundred cows out there for, for 200 days. That's a lot of dry matter that you're, you're bailing a cycle back into a, a form that the, the, the plants and the soil are going to be able to use. So your soil health, it's going to be driven, uh, and improved between your manure and your urine. So this way you're going to use less synthetics that next year. Uh, you're going to be able to reduce your tillage because the, the animals are going to eat your weeds. They're going to um, uh, eat that residue. They're going to be doing, once again, a lot of good things, the hoof action. Uh, it's going to give you an opportunity to increase your plant diversity and ideally have that continuous vegetative plant growing in your soils throughout that whole growing season. But when we're grazing, now, you know, in, in lots, a lot of parts of the world, um, you, you look at uh, some of the historical uh, uh, meccas of the world, and whether it's North Africa, if it's uh, in Israel or Greece, uh, uh, Easter Islands, a lot of these places have been destroyed, well, minus the Easter Islands. Uh, Greece used to be a, a, just a huge forest. Uh, North Africa used to be an oasis of, of vegetative growth. Uh, and, and while you look at Mesopotamia, uh, you know, the, when you look at those areas, what they, what are they now? And, you know, what, what were they a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago? Uh, and basically what happened is in, in each scenario, they were overgrazed. They were overgrazed. Uh, the natural vegetation died out and they either desert, desertified or uh, the, you know, the forest disappears and now there's only shrubs left. So we have to watch this, this grazing management and so that we're not destroying the soil. We want to build the soil. And that's part of the, the Ellen Savory management process of allowing those plants, those grassy plants and forbs to fully recover before we bite them again. So one of the things we don't want to do is we don't want to graze when the, the soil is saturated. We don't, we don't want to create any compaction issues because when we have soil and soil should have, you know, 50% air, air pores in it. And when we have a lot of, of moisture in there now, you know, that's going to take up a lot of the, the air spaces. So when we put pressure on it, first thing that's going to come out of that soil is the air. When that happens, then we go anaerobic. Now we're going to create uh, some anaerobic conditions. Now we're going to create some compaction when we have conditions like that. So it wasn't a problem the last couple of years, but uh, when we do get back into the, the wet falls again, we have to make sure that it either dries out or it freezes before we put animals out. Uh, the other thing we want to watch is making sure that we don't get a nitrate buildup in the soil. A lot of the weeds that we have in agriculture are triggered by high nitrates. So if we can have that green growing plant, it's going to absorb any of that free nitrate in the soil and, and metabolize them, create a nitrogen containing compounds in that plant. And when the, that nitrogen gets high enough into that plant, it then starts releasing it back into the soil as a root exudate. And when it's 
when it's in the, the protein, amino acids, any other uh, nitrogen containing compound besides your, your, your nitrate, your upper plants can use it, but your weeds can't. So as we go down from amino acids to, to urea, to, to, um, to ammonium, to, to nitrate, we want to catch it when it, before it gets to the nitrate stage, ideally. And then this way we, we alleviate a lot of the problems in, in, in agriculture. The other thing we want to do is try and match the plant supply with your animal nutritional needs. So if we're dealing with dry cows or we're dealing with, with um, uh, young heifers, or we want to make sure we try and balance those, those feedstocks for those particular animals. So when we start looking at integrating livestock into our land, into our operation, you know, it's going to, you know, start building soil health. When we start overgrazing and, and not utilizing these animals the way that nature is intended, this is how we start destroying the soil. We want to have those livestock integrated so we're building soil nutrient levels. We want to control these weeds. And once again, with diversity, that, that helps that too. We want to manage our crop residues. We want to increase our plant diversity that we're growing on those fields because as we increase our plant diversity, we're going to increase our micro diversity in the soils. And it's going to create new cash flow opportunities, both for the livestock producer and the, the, and the grain producer, because this way we get these synergies. So uh, here's my shameless plug. Um, this is the book that I wrote uh, last year, and it kind of goes through in, in not as much detail, but uh, be, just because I'm trying to address Western Canada, it's tough to talk about uh, sent, you know, the same, same techniques up in in Manning as compared to south of Winnipeg. So, um, but it goes through and I, it goes through a lot of the, the descriptions of the different species that, that I've seen 